Here we go. All right. We started the recording. I'm Terry Vanover. Welcome to How to Find Inner Peace During the Holidays in the Aftermath, of course, even with a high conflict. X. I'm going to show you how to do that. All right. So I'm, we're just going to take a couple of nice, deep grounding breaths just so we can get centered and focused. And it's uh, a really good time to just kind of take a few moments for ourselves. So I like to just take in a nice deep inhale, once through the nose, down into our belly and exhale through our mouth. Another nice big deep one. And as we're here together, just come and get centered, open your heart, open your mind, let go of any worries, any other issues, any to-do lists, just come and get centered and grounded with us. And one more nice deep belly breath. Great. And it's always good to just take a few seconds and just get in tune with your body, get in tune with being present, focused right here, right now. So I appreciate that. So a little bit about me. So who is Terry? If you have not heard my Southern accent, here it is. <laughs> Even though I'm located right outside of Chicago, I grew up just a poor country girl from Virginia. And uh, we were in the rural part of Virginia. My mom, you know, was a single mom. She divorced when I was quite young, um, three or four. And, you know, she was, you know, just kind of a, a working class mom. She didn't even have you know, high school education. She was raising two little girls. Our father abandoned us pretty much right after the divorce. Today, we kind of would see that he's he's a functioning alcoholic, could work and everything, but pretty much after work from then on was, was beer all night. So we pretty much were on our own from the get-go. Pretty unstable, chaotic upbringing, I would say, just you know, a lot of moving, a lot of instability as far as like food insecurity, um, babysitters shuffled around from one babysitter to the, the next. And, you know, I also was sexually abused when I was six years old by a family member. And looking back at it now, I recognize how all of that instability, all that, you know, chaos and shame that I brought up, it really interfered, interfered with my relationships, particularly my intimate relationships with my husband at the time. And so on the outside, as an adult, I had it all together. I was high functioning, I was high achieving, very career oriented, type A, all the way, <laughs> too much I would say now looking back, but my intimate relationships were a hot, hot mess. I was controlling, I was needy. I was insecure. I, I would kind of call myself like a never ending pit of like, I could not get enough reassurance. I could not get enough, um, you know, love basically. And, you know, within a few short years, my marriage deteriorated and I had two little ones, preschoolers at the time going through a divorce. And my divorce was the most horrendous time of my life for sure. I, I made a series of, you know, just ill-advised mistakes financially, emotionally, legally. It took two and a half years, two failed lawyers, two failed mediations. And also within that, you know, it was just a hot mess as far as thinking about things. And and the, I ended up being homeless, had to move in with like a friend of a friend of a friend kind of a thing. I was hit by a van while riding my bike and that led to kind of a series of health issues and I lost my mom during this time the one woman who I feel like would really understand what I was really going through so it was just you know you know what just when I thought it couldn't get worse it just kept getting worse and worse and worse and worse but I also will share how it's also the story of like hitting that rock bottom was also the the beginning of my healing journey too so now I can say, 
I, I've put it all behind me. And the reason why I kind of tell you that my divorce was your typical, you know, you know, just acrimonious, nasty, bitter divorce, because I want people to understand you can make it better. My ex-husband and I are, are friends. We co-parent. He's remarried to a beautiful woman. And I am remarried to a generous, sexy New York Italian so our kids can make fun of both of our accents. <laughs> and the four of us have, have managed to make, you know, a team for each other. And listen, we had the same divorce that everybody else has. Like we hated each other's guts. And with a few communication tricks and some healing strategies and things like that, I believe more people can have a co-parenting relationship like like we do. I don't believe like we're a unicorn. I think it is possible if people are willing to do a little introspection. Um, it is hard work, but it's so worth it. My kids are so worth it. And in addition to like having an amazing personal life with, with my extended blended family, which by the way, being a stepmom and blending a family is I, I almost think it's harder than it was going through that divorce and getting hit by that van. I joke about it, but emotionally blending a family is very, very difficult. That is why so many second marriages end in divorce at a rate of 70% almost, about 68 to 70% because it is so difficult. Trust me, been there, done that. I got the divorce sucks t-shirt, I know. <laughs> and so... I, I think it's really important that even if you put your divorce behind you, you do a lot of the healing work because the future relationships, you know, hinge on that as well. And you're going to be bringing other personalities in like my kid's step, step mom and my, my husband and things like that and his stepkids. So you're adding all these additional personalities. And so you've got to really be at your best, the best version of yourself in this new chapter. I've co-authored two women's empowerment books, which I have for sale, and they have tips and insights on how to get past those difficult moments in your life and make a better life for yourself. I've met some of my personal heroes, traveled the country doing speaking engagements and teaching people on things that I'm so, so very passionate about. So I'm, I'm very excited that I get to be here today and share this information for you. So who is this for? This is for anyone where your divorce has left you stuck. It's left you, um, let me see if I can close this window. It's like popping out for me. It's left you stuck. It's left you feeling anxious. It's left you um mistrustful, constantly second guessing yourself, feeling dejected, feeling like you're unworthy, feeling unlovable, feeling lonely. I'm going to uh, talk about that one in, in particular. And for me, this was a big one for me because of my upbringing and, and just never really feeling safe as a child. I became emotionally unavailable. And I would expect a lot from my ex-husband and you know those that love me like expect a lot but I I really was emotionally unavailable myself in a sense because I was had walled off a lot of a lot of my deep inner feelings because of my own shame and my own feelings of unworthiness so why is it important that we're talking about this right now well because the holidays amplify these negative feelings, this loneliness, this feeling like you don't belong, these feelings of feeling stuck and insecure, lacking confidence, they, they amplify this even more because of the expectations. You know, I was just writing a piece today about that, like, what, well, why does, shouldn't the holidays be this joyous moment? Well, A, some of us might still be grieving of what we thought this part of our life would be, what this holiday might have been. But what I also, you know, was thinking about was like how there's this sense of nostalgia of like, oh, if only it could be like it was in the past and sense of family. But the truth is, if, if you've gone through a divorce, you're actually trying to forge a new path, new traditions, a new way of being. So there's this cognitive dissonance within us of trying to rectify this nostalgia that's constantly being bombarded 
to us with this sense of like trying to move forward. So before I move ahead, I would love to just know what your biggest issue is, what your biggest challenge is. If you want to type it in the chat box, if you want to just voice that, just so I can make sure that I am addressing whatever it is that needs to be addressed. Um, well, for me, this is the first holiday season that I am separated and it just, it feels like I'm failing constantly mm -hmm. because I'm not giving my kids that two parent Christmas and, but, and so that makes me sad and depressed, but, um, but I, I'm trying to find a silver lining. There's been a lot of things that we've done during the holiday season that I don't love. And it's like, it's, a, it's an opportunity to reinvent the holiday with my kids. And so yeah. I'm pulling out some new things to do that, you know, that are different than the past so that we're can, we can kind of like make it our own. Excellent. Excellent. You're, you're exactly right, Jillian, that it is about accepting what is and forging a new path. And like you said, accepting that the holidays aren't what they used to be and that those traditions might change and moving forward and figuring out what are some new memories we can create? What are some new, new traditions that we can create together? Because I do think people get caught up on what was rather than thinking about what can I create? What can we, you know, even with our kids, like what can we co-create this holiday season that would make it memorable for us? What do we need? What do we want? And so I'm a big, big, big believer in setting intentions. And we do that a lot. The kids and I, the family, we have family meetings all the time, much to my kids' chagrin. <laughs> oh, another family meeting. But it gives them a voice, an outlet where we set our intentions. You know, what, what do we want to create this holiday season? What do we want? What do we want to get out of this holiday season? So setting an intention is really important of living intentionally, right? Not living from the past, living right now in the present. So I love that. Right. Well, we did that. Yeah, we did. We did that this weekend. It was really nice. Um, you know, we've always, we've always had just these Christmases where it's like the presents just like it, there's more and more every year and every year that there's more presents, I'm like, oh gosh, this just feels worse and worse. So this year I was like, you know what? I would rather take that money. And I've always wanted to just like go somewhere for Christmas, spend it together, um, not give gifts, maybe just one. And so I talked to my older two kids this weekend and they were surprisingly so excited about it. And I, and I was like, oh my gosh, you know, I know that they love these gifts and the presents and stuff like that, but they actually were so on board with wanting to do this family trip instead that it was just it was really encouraging and exciting because it's been so depressing, you know, as I'm putting the Christmas decorations out and, and I'm like, Oh, we always do it this way. But you know, I didn't really like how we used to do it. It's just the way that we did it. So now I get to like choose how we do it every year. And I was really thrilled that the kids were on board with it. So. Love it. Yeah. I love it. I love that you've set in that intentionality. We're like, well, it's always been done this way. Well, why, you know? And so I love that you're setting those intentions. Love it. So thanks. I do. I love it too. It, it's, it's very motivating. Yeah. So one of the things that makes what I do and who I am and my process different from say traditional talk therapy is that it's a multifaceted process. I believe that in order to, to be the best virgin of, version of ourselves moving forward, we must have a systematic multifaceted approach to healing. And that's truly where the change is going to be. You know, I had only gone so far in my healing. And then when I started integrating some other strategies and, and intentional exercises and breath work and body work and, and integrated that into the healing process, it just took me to a whole nother level. So I'm going to kind of touch on that as we move through this about that. But I want to talk about why, why these things kind of occur so that you can understand why the healing process needs to be a multifaceted process and not just a talk therapy. Well, if you're second guessing yourself, if you're feeling anxious, if you're an overthinker, 
Perhaps you don't have healthy boundaries. And I see this in particular with women who are people pleasers, they constantly second guess themselves, they're constantly feeling anxious. And I believe that anxiety really manifest it's a it's an outward expression of something inward that's manifesting as a physical anxiety but it's really something internal that we need to look at and so when you are a nice guy or you're a people pleaser the thing is you're actually a ticking time bomb <laughs> because people pleasers I uh, seem really nice on the on the outside but all that anxiety all that like stuff on the inside it builds up and they really become a ball of resentment and anger and it comes out some way if you feel like you're a failure you feel like everything's your fault if you feel like you're not good enough if you're feeling anxious like i said I, it, anxiety is a manifestation of deeper issues that need to be addressed and healed and Oftentimes, I feel like people who struggle with overthinking, second guessing, they really just don't know how to trust themselves. They've never been taught. They don't know the keys to trusting themselves. So you end up being susceptible to toxic people being taken advantage of in toxic relationships. And then you begin to settle for less personally and professionally. It's always interesting to me, although I work with people specifically on their relationships, when we work together on those relationships, it's amazing how their businesses flourish and they become <laughs> like they get the promotion they've always wanted and they get way more clients and they get paid way, 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 way more. It's because they've always settled for less. When they stop settling for less and start demanding more, it's showing up professionally as well. So the reason why you're an overthinker, you're anxious, you're second guess yourself is because your nervous system is out of whack because you've never really felt safe and secure. So what people pleasers do and nice guides do is they end up looking for validation from other people so that you never really learn to trust yourself. You're always asking for other people's opinions or expecting other people to tell you how to feel or what to do or second guessing yourself. So you really have not learned how to really trust your instincts, trust your intuition. Now, the reason why that is, is often we have unhealed abandonment issues and childhood trauma that causes our nervous system to be out of whack. Like I explained in the beginning of this, this, this um, class was I didn't realize until I've done so much you know, trauma work and trauma classes, how much that insecure childhood I had, the poverty, the food insecurity, the, the babysitter, the babysitter, the babysitter, you know, left me feeling like, like in a constant state of like fight or flight. And so it happens when you have an emotionally unavailable parent. Sometimes it can happen when you have a mentally ill parent, um, you know, you've got that father who's distant, who never gives you any, any, you know, of that attention or, or validation. You have trauma, or maybe you had a parent who had trouble with alcohol. And again, it's that um, in and out, in and out within, within the family unit, you know, sometimes they're present, sometimes they're not, or, you know, they're going to be volatile, or maybe they're not, you don't know what to expect. And Oftentimes, I see people who come to me, many of my, my women people pleasers tend to come from childhoods where uh, as their family unit was very like conservative traditionally, and children should be seen and not heard So their own intuition, their own needs, their desires were, were suppressed as a child. They never learned how to voice their opinions, they never learned how to tap into that intuition because it was more important that you fit into the family unit. Another thing that causes you to really second guess yourself is getting into toxic relationships where you have, you know, if you were married for a long period of time, where you had to walk on eggshells, your body, again, it got out of whack. Your nervous system got out of whack because you were so um, busy trying to keep the peace at the price of your own mental health. So toxic relationships, intimate relationships can really, really take a toll on you. Self-esteem, anxiety, second guessing. 
So this is where I'll kind of share my story in particular about the loneliness. If you are chronically lonely and you feel like you're not good enough, you feel like you're always failing, like I'm never good, it's never good enough. The thing is, what I love about that, the good news is, is that these negative emotions are here to teach us something about ourselves. So the triggers, when your ex-husband triggers you, when you feel judged by the boss, when you have negative emotions, these are indicators where you still need to heal. Now, like I said, I incorporate a lot of different modalities and the, the practice of meditation is integral to faster recovery. The more you teach how to soothe that, that nervous system and tap into that reflection, intuition, calm thoughts, all those things really, really help you. So my loneliness was the start of my journey. For me, you know, I was, like I explained at the beginning, I was, this was the worst time in my life. I'd lost family, I'd lost friends, I'd lost my mom, I'd lost my home, lost my husband, lost time with my kids. I was on the verge of losing my job because I was just a hot emotional mess. I could not, I was barely functioning at this time. The one good thing, <laughs> honestly, one of, one of the good things, actually, I did two good things, I think, during my divorce was um, one of the good things was like, I recognized the loneliness because I was sitting in that bed, crying myself to sleep, holding my little babies in my arms at night, crying myself. And when I wasn't crying myself to sleep, I was in the basement just just watching sad documentaries. And the the aha moment came for me was, you know, and this is the truth. I'm always very transparent in these classes in that I really, really, really wanted to go out and get male attention. I was really craving a man to look at me and tell me I'm, I'm, I'm beautiful and, and to get that attention and to feel like, oh, you're so smart and you're so funny and really wanted that male attention. But for me, I, I resisted that at that time because I said, you know, you were, you were lonely during the marriage and you're lonely now. The common denominator is you. You, you have to just sit with this and you've got to stop distracting yourself with, this, with men. And I was like, you know, and I just sat in that basement night after night, crying my little eyes out, the ugly crying. And it was, that's when I had the aha moment of like, oh, I, I think I'm, I'm unlovable. When I, when I allowed those emotions to come up underneath that loneliness was, was really just, I felt unlovable. And the connection for me was realizing, wow, if my own father or my own biological father doesn't love me, and there were instances he had even told me I was fat, I was ugly, you know, just things like that. And so, wow, I, I must be unlovable. And for me, it was just that, that, just that connection for me was a turning point in my life. So I also want to tell people that abandonment, it can be physical abandonment, like my own experience with my biological father. But I have had plenty of two-parent households where they insist, I'm, I don't have abandonment issues. I don't have abandonment issues. And within one session, I have identified exactly when that abandonment issue <laughs> occurred and how it was proliferated within, within their parents. And listen, I know our parents are doing the best they can. It's nobody's fault. They had to deal with their own generational trauma. They had to deal with their own shit growing up. I mean, they weren't given tools on how to parent. And so, you know, they did the best they can. So this is not a blame game of our parents. And I think a lot of people become very defensive of their parents. And I get that. We can love our parents, but also love ourselves enough to know that, wow, they just, they just didn't know how to give me what I needed at that time. So maybe you had the physical abandonment, or maybe you had a parent who was emotionally unavailable through their own issues. Unrealistic parent expectations. I had one client and Unless he presented in a certain way, did certain things, his parents were very adamant that they were not going to give him attention and validation and accolades. They did not accept him as he was. 
their love was conditional, conditional on did he fit into the mold of what they wanted. So your abandonment issues will leave you with a feeling of unworthiness. And that is really the fundamental feeling of loneliness. If you really sit with that loneliness, like I did night after night, again, I think there's a, a quicker way to do it, <laughs> a better way to do it now. Um, but ultimately, you'll realize how these feelings of loneliness, really, it's about a feeling of like unlovability, or I'm unworthy, or I don't matter. It's different for every client. That's why it's important to, to do the one on one sessions, because when I talk with people one on one, I can can identify exactly their verbiage and what their abandonment wound was and when and how to prescribe the antidote to that because it's different for everyone. Okay, so I might come back to my client Sue and her black sheet thing because that's a really important one is like for some people it's just feeling like they're the black sheep of their family. And so like, hey, I don't belong, I, I don't matter, I'm different, any of that stuff. And oftentimes the black sheep of the family is often just the child who is is the functional one in a dysfunctional pattern. So ironically, so, you know, Peter Crone, he's one of my favorite teachers and, and um, all, uh, you know, authors. He, he always says that life will present you with people and events to reveal where you still need healing. And I love that because if you understand that the triggers, whether they're from your ex, or that shitty boss, or that girlfriend who keeps using you, or your own children, because I believe our children are our best teachers, their behavior is exposing a wound in you that only you can heal. And until you do that, you're an emotional prisoner to other people and you will never, ever find peace. You'll always be at the whim of whatever outside circumstance is going on. And, you know, I always say you cannot heal. You can't heal inner problems with outside solutions. And that's what all of us are doing. We're distracting ourselves with the phone or we're watching Netflix. Or we're numbing ourselves with alcohol or food or whatever that is. Um, or for me, you know, looking to men to make me feel better about myself, whatever that is. And so when we understand, wow, what's coming up for me? What, what, what do I really need in this? What, what's going on really deep down? And it does take practice to reflect and to, to meditate and to figure out. And then once you do, once you have the keys to unlock that, the freedom is, is right there. And the thing is, the other thing is, is people, what a lot of people come to me for is after the second divorce. So I always commend people who are like right on the verge of divorce who come to me. I love that because then we can work through those issues and hopefully either save the marriage or get a great co-parenting relationship going on. Because when you work on yourself, all the relationships around you totally transform. And until you figure out what, what, what's going on and heal those underlying things, you're susceptible to repeating these toxic relationships. Oftentimes people say, oh, I, you know, I married, you know, whatever, you know, buzzword narcissist of the day is or whatever. I, you know, and it's, you know, he was this, he was that. Well, you know, we have to heal that underlying wound that causes us to minimize those red flags and other people and causes us not to stand up for ourselves and not to voice ourselves. Because the thing is, repeated toxic relationships continue to do damage. They do damage to our self-esteem. So again, just that sympathetic nervous system gets out of whack, which totally destroys us on so many levels, which can affect our health, affect our immune systems, affect our mental health, our physical health, how we show up at work, all of that. So. You know, one of my best success stories is Linda. <laughs> she came to me right after her divorce. I'm laughing because I, even I can't even imagine that it has come the way that it has. When she came to me and our, you know, our goal, our intention, we, we just wanted to go have a respectful, you know, drop off. Like they were in the driveway, the sun's getting out of the truck screaming at each other. 
you know, so just, just, we just need to get to a respectful co-parenting relationship. And now, I mean, and she was very anxious, right? Just even, even leading up to that, she was a, a hot, 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 hot mess. You know, you can imagine how difficult this was. And because I gave her some tips and tricks and like things to like remove herself from that dance, right? They've been locked in this dance for years and years and years, this negative dance, communication dance. Now y'all, they hang out. Like even I'm like, wait, what? You know, they hang out. They're totally cool. They're fine. They go on vacations together with their, their kid. It is amazing. She has a career now. She's not anxious. She's like totally at peace. It's, it is totally, totally amazing. And just because she changed, this husband didn't do anything different. It's just how she, when, when we shift who we are, the whole dynamics of all of our relationships completely, completely change. Again, same here. I've had the same experience. Me and my ex-husband were the same way during our divorce. And if you had told me, oh, y'all are going to be eating Thanksgiving your your ex husband's gonna be bringing your favorite wine. I would be like, wait, what? You know, I wouldn't have believed you, but it's totally possible. So, you know, the thing is, is that you've got to understand that those unhealed triggers go back to how you perceived something as child, and it's 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 your perception of what happened to you and how you internalize that and how you perceive that and you kept that within your own body. And when you take responsibility for yourself, you take back control. When you say, oh, my ex-husband triggered me or my ex-wife triggers me, you're giving them the power. You're giving them control. But if you understand what is it about me that's feeling emotionally erupted by whatever they're doing, by whatever they're saying. And when you understand that and you're no longer triggered, you can approach all of these things from a place of clarity, from a place of peace, from a place of love and acceptance. And when you are approaching all of your relationships from this place of peace and love and total alignment and not from a place of fear and scarcity, and anger, and, and hatred, then those relationships completely shift. Doesn't mean that that person has to be a different person. I'm not saying that because like I said, I've got many, many blended family components in my life, you know, but I don't allow that to disrupt my own peace. And it doesn't disrupt my own clarity and how I approach the situations. I can't always change other people, change what they do, change what they say. And that's okay. And I accept that. But I can change how I approach that person and how I respond versus react to that person. So if you identify the exact root of that insecurity, of that trigger, and you heal that wound using, I, I use a, a, a variety of inner child healing tools and conscious intentional tools, reparenting techniques, as well as other, other modalities, you will show up totally, totally different. I mean, even in my own marriage, these tools I still use to this day when I'm being triggered by someone else and I recognize, oh, this is what's going on within me. And I have the self-awareness and the self-knowledge and the inner healing to know, oh, I'm being triggered because I feel unsafe and I don't feel protected and I'm projecting that. This is an actual thing that happened where I projected that onto my husband, where I felt like he needed to stand up for me. He needed to take my side, blah, blah, blah. You know, I was in this and I recognized, wow, that's that little girl that's needing protection. Well, my you know, as much as I love my husband, <laughs> he can't give that little girl what she needs. Only I can. So as soon as you recognize that and give yourself what you're wanting from everyone else, you can show up in those relationships as a whole person, as a whole being. And I no longer look to my partner to rescue me or to give me what I need because we are two whole people bringing a relationship together. And it is such a different dynamic than two 
I don't like to use the word broken, but people usually know what I'm saying when I say two broken people trying to fix each other it is a completely different dynamic. And just having that relationship and giving that to our kids is amazing. Or even when I don't expect that of my ex-husband and just let him be and not, not let him trigger me. I mean, we're not perfect. We make mistakes. We, you know, we don't always see eye to eye. We don't always agree on everything. But when we approach each other from a place of acceptance and love and can speak from a place of clarity versus anger and fear, we can co-parent and be constructive. It's so, so, so possible. I'm, <laughs> and there's a little, uh, I put a little testimonial there. The pain is gone. A major thank you to Terry Vanover for all the talks of encourage and advice and advice I'll have for the rest of my life. And I agree with that because when you learn these tools, although it's, it's applicable for healing from divorce, from dealing with a toxic ex-spouse, I mean, these can be, you use this in all areas of your life and your whole life is transformed. And that's really the truth really the truth. So I would love to talk with you one-on-one -on -one where I have set aside a complimentary strategy session because like I said earlier in this, in this class, everyone has like their own specific abandonment wound and their own traumatic event that kind of led to where they are. And identifying that is specific to each one-on-one -on -one person. So what I do on these life-changing sessions is I'm going to show you how to identify the exact root of your unhealed wound so that you stop feeling lonely, you stop feeling not good enough, so that you stop feeling like a failure, and you can feel secure and confident in all of your relationships. And then I'm going to give you that four point plan that I talked about, that strategic plan that you need that's specific to you that will help you stop second guessing yourself so you feel confident, so you feel worthy and so that you have those firm boundaries in all of your relationships and you're not second guessing yourself and you feel really good and you feel really um, worthy, confident really is the best one, secure moving forward in this new chapter. So what I'm gonna do I'm looking forward to hearing from you in the chat box. I actually have a session here and I'm just gonna put this in here. And all you have to do is click on that link and that link takes you right over to my calendar. And I, like I said, I've set aside some, some uh, sessions where we can talk one-on-one. -on -one. So excited. I love talking one-on-one -on -one to people. All right, I think I have closed out my chat. Let's see. I will stop sharing and I would just love to know if you want to write in the chat box, you want to just share what, what's your biggest takeaway from today? Yeah, I'm excited to talk to you. I love talking. On the phone. <laughs> I'm one of those rare people that just loves calls. Yeah. Did you have a like takeaway or something that kind of resonated with you today, Jillian? If you didn't, that's okay. If you don't want to share, that's okay too. Just want to check in with you. Hmm. Several things. Okay. Looking for validation from from men, girl. Yes, <laughs> you be you be shocked how many like I think I think a lot of us like especially the strong independent like I would have considered like myself as an ultra independent, and just to catch myself like I said looking for that protection from my husband like my now husband like like whoa what's going on here look looking for that that male figure because we didn't get that from from our fathers we didn't get what we needed as 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 young girls and so I am I am an open book you know I've had people on podcasts ask me 
is it okay if I ask about the sexual abuse? And I'm like, yeah, like I'd start out my speeches with it. <laughs> um, I like, I have no secrets because I believe we're only as sick as our secrets. And so I'm, I'm also, I have to be vulnerable and share that so that other people know, oh, okay, I, this resonates with me. Okay. Like, what is this about? Like, why am I feeling this way? And I believe like, you know, when we bring those shadows out into the light, they no longer have power over us. So it's really important that we get clear about that. And I'm, I'm an open book. And so I, sh I'll share all my secrets and dirty little stuff because I don't want people to feel like ashamed because there's no shame that we had to cope the way we did, you know, sometimes those uh, coping skills are not the best. And so there's a better way, much better way. Yes. Okay. Shame. Yes. Yes. I had to live with a lot of shame. Yes. Yes. I live with a lot of shame, a shame for about a lot of things. And I will tell you the hardest part of forgiveness, because I do a lot of forgiveness work all throughout what I do was, is forgiving myself. I forgave the sexual abuser. I forgave um, oh, my alcoholic father. I forgave my ex-husband. I forgave all the people that wronged me way before I was ready to forgive myself for some of the things I said and did and do. You know, we all we all make mistakes. So forgiveness is huge. I love I love it though. All right, so I am gonna let you go and hopefully you got that link down. It's in the chat box. Um, you can just pop on there and schedule and hopefully I will be talking to you. Yeah, it's always easier to forgive others than ourselves because I, the shame, it actually is a form, again, it's another form of protection. And, and when we're clouded in shame, it kind of protects us in a sense, It's a, but it becomes maladaptive because then we start hiding and we start, um, losing our self-compassion because of it. So, all right. Well, thank you all for hopping on and thanks for talking with me and being so open and sharing. I so appreciate this and I look forward to talking with you. Yay.